It's a, it's a good hour. It's a, it's a good hour. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. Welcome everyone to another meeting of the Hibiscus Coast Astronomical Society. And uh, we've got quite a few uh, new people joining us today. So uh, very uh, welcome to you. Um, as uh, some people have heard, we have a new venue and we can uh, now talk about it. Um, we will be meeting at uh, Fungaparoa College going forward. Um, that will be probably when we uh, reach the orange level. But um, uh, just uh, keep checking on the Facebook group. Uh, we'll also be sending, of course, emails uh, to let people know exactly what's going on there. But yeah, that's a very good outcome for very hard work from uh, Chris and Jay. Um, yeah, so thank you guys for uh, going out and uh, sorting that out. I think it's uh, a big weight lifted off everyone's shoulders. Um, so the venue itself is, is very, very nice. Um, I know Chris, do you want to talk a little bit about what it, what it looks like inside? Yeah, well, um, I'm confirming it with them all tomorrow and stuff, but yeah, it's, it's the foyer in the um, auditorium. It's lovely, it's spacious, nice high ceiling, air conditioning, little superette bathrooms, nice carpeted, uh, nice seats, um, nice open. We can ventilate with some windows if we need to. Lovely, lovely spot, lovely spot. Not um, easy to get to from the main car park. We'll have a sign obviously out directing people. Um, and it's right next to some dark skies sort of by their field. So spot on. Um, we're just trying to keep it sort of, I think, um, just until the next week, sort of just between us, I think, until we chat with the, um, have one last chat with school. But it's all secured, essentially, they've offered to us and we've passed the resolution this evening. And um, I'm emailing them tomorrow to, to say, yep, that's, that's great, thanks. Yeah, so that's the first thing. The next thing is that uh, we will have our AGM on the, what date was that? The 7th, Thursday the 7th. So I'm going to ask, what time is it? 7.30? Because I'm going to ask for the length question. Yeah, 7.30. Yeah, yeah so it, it'll, it'll be our next meeting, which is on the 7th. So that's in uh, three weeks' time. So I uh, urge everyone to uh, join us for that one, um, especially if you're a paid up member. Um, if not, that you're still welcome to join us and uh, share your thoughts and ideas as well. Uh, but yeah, we, we need to have members so that we can have a quorum for that, that AGM. So uh, please yeah, mark them in the calendar. We will send out reminders and that over the course of the next couple of weeks as well. So it's a springtime on Mars, apparently, and uh, the dunes are defrosting. Uh, so a couple of, uh, sort of sort of the higher power telescopes and uh, have uh, been observing this as well as a couple of uh, the orbiters. Um, so it's uh, the time of year when um, the you can actually see the, the frost on the dunes uh, busy melting off. Uh, so part of the AGM will be online uh, on Zoom. Um, Eugene Parker, who is uh, or was a visionary heliophysicist, uh, has recently passed away as well at the age of 94. And uh, you'll Probably know his name from the Parker Solar Probe, uh, which after which it is named. And um, yeah, so uh, he lived a very long life and you know, his uh, sort of, sort of entire study was on the sun and uh, what it, all, all the different features of the sun. And, uh, He's broken so many frontiers of our understanding of uh, not only of the sun, but also stars as well. So that was quite sad news that came out today. Um, 
one thing people are asking is in, the, in this season when we can observe Saturn is to keep an eye for any little white spots on Saturn because uh, apparently this is something that's been observed before. Um, not very well documented. So uh, those people with bigger telescopes are urged to have a look for the, the little white spots on Saturn. I will skip all the news of the James Webb because I'm sure someone will be dealing with that a little bit later. Um, there's also been uh, an article released uh, talking about exoplanets and how uh, smaller ground-based telescopes can also study exoplanet atmospheres. Um, so this was put up by a uh, universe today and it's on our Facebook group. Um, quite an interesting read uh, if you want to go and have a look at that one. Um, so the other interesting articles uh, was one by Fizzorg, Fizz.org, um, uh, talking about launching robots to explore lunar caves. Uh, we have uh, talked about this uh, previously, um, and this is actually looking like it might become reality sooner rather than later. Uh, so basically, uh, these robots will go into the caves looking for uh, things like uh, water ice that might be there, as well as study things like uh, is, uh, radiation, like will that get through um, the rock? Uh, of the regolith, um, it's how well how well will that protect uh, so future astronauts going up there and forming a base there uh, as well. So quite quite a lot of interesting things going on there with the moon. Um, uh, coming up also in the next uh, couple of days, we've got two geomagnetic storms uh, which will be hitting Earth. Uh, we just had one a couple of days ago, which produced some spectacular aurora. Uh, so further down south, Queenstown, I think there were a couple of really spectacular um, uh, photos of that. And a little bit further up. Uh, the nice thing with these geomagnetic storms is uh, they are quite large, which means that there is a possibility that we could actually see them up here in Auckland. Uh, I've managed to see it once before, uh, right in the distant horizon, so uh, it is possible. So keep an eye out on the space weather and uh, hopefully you get to see an aurora from Auckland as well. So I think uh, that's about it for me. All those articles are on the Facebook uh, group, uh, so you can go and have a look and read a bit more in detail uh, with that. And um, without further ado, I'll pass it on to Chris. Thanks. Thanks there, um, James. Okay, I'm going to share my uh, screen, what I should do now. So, screen machine, just make sure I do this correctly. Uh, here we go here, James Webb version two. Let's just check this all works. Um, okay, can we see that, guys? Does it come up? Uh, we can see uh, something on your desktop, but it's not for presentation. It's just a list of files. Okay, I've clicked on that. Okay, let's screen sharing now, slideshow. Let's play from the start. Are you seeing that? No, no, no. Okay, it's... let's share. Let's push uh, share again. How about that? Uh, yeah, yeah. There we go. yeah. yeah. We're good. We're good to go. It's always a bit of a fiddle, isn't it? <laughs> Okay, so I've got my screen down the side there. I'm just gonna play around and see if I can uh, make everything a bit smaller. That's good, so I can see more of my screen. Um, yeah, okay, good evening. Welcome everyone, thanks for, uh, for joining in and I hope you enjoy the talk this evening. So Christmas day last year. Yep, everyone's sort of stopped and um, I don't know about you guys or it was Christmas day for the rest of the world, it was Boxing Day at 1 a.m. in the morning for us. Um, and I know I was one of the people very anxiously waiting to see 
how it went, but um, you know, the most uh, latest and the most technologically advanced space telescope ever, um, 25 years in the making was launched on Christmas day last year. And I'm sure a lot of you will uh, recall all the media coverage, the big lead up to it, the launch and how it all went. I'm sure you, you pretty much all, I don't know, you don't know where you would have been if you wouldn't have been caught up in all of that. So it was pretty cool and pretty exciting. But quite a few people would actually say to me just on the side when they're talking about it, what's actually so special about the James Webb? What's it all about? And that's why tonight's talk is titled The James Webb Space Telescope, Gateway to a Golden Era in Astronomy. And tonight you're going to get an introduction of the James Webb Space Telescope, um, what exactly it is, uh, who's behind it, um, where it is at the moment, uh, what's part of the sort of light spectrum is it observing in, um, why is it observing in particular wavelengths, what its targets are going to be. I've also got three short videos here for you, so we're going to have a bit of, bit of fun this evening. But most importantly this evening, you are going to see straight away how the James Webb Space Telescope is providing a gateway to a golden era in astronomy. That's the key message tonight. So I've broken it into the discussion into five chapters, uh, a little bit about what it is, who developed it, where it is in space, what's going on, and mention the wavelength range and uh, why it's operating there. And then uh, we'll have a couple of videos at the end, one during it, and then we'll give it a, an update from NASA's um, media release today, very fresh off the, off the press, uh, what's been happening with with the James Webb, and then we'll finish with three sticky messages to take home. So first up, what is the James Webb Space Telescope? Well, this is a full scale model of it at the NASA's um, Goddard Space Flight Center, where a lot of the uh, development, construction and, and assembly of the telescope has occurred. Um, to give you an idea of the size, I don't know exactly, but I've counted at least about 400 people in that photo. Um, you'll sit here, they're all here, and you'll see the, the big sun shield here. That is the size of a tennis court. Amazing, isn't it? Um, this big mirror here, we're going to have a look close up of that too. That's six and a half meters across diameter. So that's a whopping big uh Big, big instrument, isn't it? And there it is. So that's a full scale model. And it puts it in perspective next to about 400 odd people on the front lawn. Um, so, so for the next few slides, we've got a nice little picture gallery for you. Um, and then we'll talk about a little bit more about the sunshade and the mirror size and hey, wh why, why have such a big mirror? So there's the sunshade. Look at the size of it compared with those people. You'll see it's in five layers. Um, it's made of a material called Kapton, which is a thermoplastic type of material that it tolerates extreme temperatures in space. It tolerates the cold, it tolerates extreme heat. It's like an insulation type of, type of um, material. So Kapton, um, and that's it. it it'll, that is so large, of course, that needs to be all sort of rolled up and foiled up um, for it to be launched, which we'll have a closer look at shortly. And its main purpose is to protect the James Webb in particular, the instruments in the mirror in particular, from the, the heat and the light given out by the sun, the earth, and also the moon. Look at the size of it. I'll just take my time through some of these photos. They're just lovely. I hope you guys have got big computer screens there to enjoy these. No, I, I just love them. Okay, so here's a close up of the mirror. As you can see it's 6.5 meters diameter. 6.5, you know, I don't know, but you know, the size of this room, if I've, I've given this talk before in a live room. And um, you know, try and sort of measure out 6.5 meters. That's big. That's that's a big space. It's broken down into 18 uh, hexagonal sort of modules, if you will, um, sort of to allow it to fit in because it's got to get all folded up to fit for launch. Um, the each those little hexagonal modules are made of beryllium. Why beryllium? Beryllium is a very light metal, but it's also very rigid, in particular in the extreme colds of space. Because you think about it, you think, well, metal's, you know, metal's okay. Metal um, gets quite brittle sometimes in the cold, you know, like a, you know, steel and stuff. It can get quite brittle. So beryllium is light, so it's cheap to launch and get it up there. It's cheap to maneuver around, and it's rigid and particularly in the cold of space. Um, it's coated with gold. Why gold as opposed to, say, silver and stuff? Gold is a more effective 
at reflecting infrared wavelengths of light than, than say the, your standard silver and stuff that you get with um, standard mirrors you know, for um, light and the visual or optical wavelengths. And the other thing, it's quite stable. It doesn't corrode in the environment of space. Um, as I mentioned here, the mirror also has to be folded up nicely. So we're going to have a, a look at that as well. I think that's one of my next slides here is, yeah, so here's a picture here just of it all folded up. You can see the, the middle part of it here and the two wings, if you will, all tucked up around the side. There's a photo from the side of the wings here. And I put this here just once again for you to enjoy looking at it from a different angle. Um, and also against the size of the technicians here. I see there's a... Um, there's a comment in the chat. I can't see the chat, but there'll be questions at the end of it. Um, there'll be plenty of opportunities to ask questions, but we'll do that at the end, just because I'm unsure what the chat's about. But look at that. Isn't that, isn't that fantastic? Enjoy. Okay, so yeah, why such a big mirror? So what I've done, first of all, let's have a look. Here's a person here. So, you know, an average person, should we call it sort of, um, you know, 1.7, 1.8 meters or so. Here's the prime mirror for the Hubble Space Telescope, just here, 2.4 meters across. That was considered pretty big in its time for a space telescope. Here it is. This is a scale drawing, three, six, sorry, 6.5 meters across, um, which gives it over six times the collecting area um, from Hubble. Um, and as I mentioned, it's broken into those 18 hexagonal se segments. Uh, and the other thing to point out here is that uh, one of my screens is blocked by all this uh, writing at the top. But anyway, the large mirror, the point of a large mirror is it increases the area to capture particles or photons of light, which means it can provide a much brighter signal. It can see fainter objects because it can capture more of the photons and it gives better resolution or better sort of detail when you're observing something. So that's the, those are the two main reasons why you want a big mirror. In fact, if you go to buy a telescope anywhere in any shop, they'll try and tell you, you know, this magnification, that magnification, there's one question to ask them, what is the size of the primary mirror? That's the key for any telescope. It means you can see fainter objects and you can see them in better detail. Um, yeah, here's a um, nice little picture here of the secondary sort of mirror, the secondary mirrors in here, and that's the support structure that holds it in place. We're going to look at the optics, actually, we're going to do that right now. Um, but I just thought I'd show that's lying on its side. There's the central part of the uh, primary mirror, and the, the side sort of bits, uh, wings are tucked up onto the side here, out of view. And that's the nice big structure there. Once again, look, there's a technician there. So you can get the idea of the size of this thing. It's huge. It's, you know, it's, it's a big structure. It's something. So here's um, of the optics. And once again, I can't see any of my writing at the top because of the layout, but that's okay. It's a three mirror and a stagmatic design, which means it's got three mirrors, primary, here's your primary mirror here with the light, like bounces down to a second mirror, then to a tertiary mirror. And the curvatures of those three mirrors are designed such that um, it can afford the telescope having a nice wide field of view with minimal optic aberrations. Because often as the wider field of view, you sort of a little extra sort of aberrations and abnormalities sneak into the light pattern. And so this is sort of, it's, it's a, um, it's sort of you're starting to see this design on some of the more big professional telescopes now. It's a Cassegrain design in terms of the focus is a Cassegrain, but it's also got a what they call a fine steering mirror. So when the light comes through here, it actually then uh, there's a little motor. We're going to learn later on about the FGS, the um, fine guidance sensor, and that's able to control this fine steering mirror and direct the light precisely down to the focal plane at the back behind the mirror. That's called a Cassegrain focal point. Um, because it's behind the primary mirror there. And that's where all the instruments are positioned. So that's the sort of the um, optical design um, of that three mirror um, a, 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 um, anastagmatic design. So who developed the JST? Yeah. And essentially it was a combination 
Um, no one organization or country could afford a large thing like this. It started off 1996, the mid-90s, with a budget of half a billion, but with various things, delays and cost overruns, etc., it soon blew out $10 billion, and the launch date, of course, was last Christmas. So that's too much for one crowd to take on. There's too much to develop and so on, the expenses of it, but just the technology. So it's, it's a um, three groups it's worked on it. There's NASA. Uh, which, of course, is the United States of America Space Agency, the European Space Agency, which represents 22 different countries, um, and then the Canadian Space Agency. Um, now, who was James Webb? He was a sort of a key, one of the main administrators for NASA, sort of certainly the key administrator for NASA in the 60s um, during those early crucial years of getting uh, men to the moon, so the projects Mercury, Gemini, and the Apollo missions. So it's really a, a nod to him. Um, okay, so where is the James Webb located in space? And, you know, what's going on out there? So it was launched um, into deep space and very quickly, as soon as it gets up into, uh, you know, sort of above the Earth's atmosphere, uh -huh. the protective cover comes off it to expose it and it starts heading out towards a place called L2, which we're gonna talk more about one and a half kilometers out. But it, on the journey in the first, it takes a month to get out to this point L2, which I'm gonna show you more about. I'm sure you've heard the term L2. Um, it goes through a series of um, sequence, sort of, of unfolding sequence, whereby sort of some uh, stability platforms come out. The solar panels come out nice and early because it needs energy from the sun to do with this. Of course, that's how it's powered. A lot of, um, a lot of spacecraft are powered by, uh, um, by uh, uh, is it called RT, RTGs, the radio um, uh, radioactivity generators, um, thermal generators, RTGs, but that's solar powered. So you can see they come out and then the sun shield starts to get unfoiled. It starts to get, uh, the five layers start to get separated. The tension goes on to it. Secondary mirror starts coming out. Um, the side lateral mirrors come out from there. Um, and, and, uh, and then, Finally, at the end of the month, that's what you've got. I've actually got a nice little video to show this. This is quite cool. So it's um, it's just under two minutes. Here Sorry, just just before you do that, um, there's a, a couple of people who've uh, who are not muted. Please, could you just mute your your microphone? Okay. So we're getting some weird feedback. And stuff. Yeah. Yep. That's good. Okay, so, so uh, Tony, I think your yours is not muted. Okay, All right, we'll get. To, um, okay, so here it is. Um, one month condensed down to one minute forty-five seconds. Yay! Here we go, guys. This is quite cool.
you know, I think they did a good job of that. So that's sort of the first month what went on while it was heading into space. It was going through the, um, you know, deploying its various instruments and things. We don't need that. We've seen that once before. So yeah, it was heading out. So it's one and a half. So here's a picture. There's the sun. Here's the earth. Here's the moon. And it heads out to a point called L2 or Lagrange point two, which is 1.5 million kilometers out that way away from the sun. And you might think, mm, that's a crazy place to put a telescope. Why? So let's have a look. So the bottom line is it's a point of gravitational stability between the sun, the earth, and the moon. Whenever you get a sort of a two-body system like this with one essentially orbiting and much bigger, you get these five points called Lagrange point after the guy Lagrange, French guy who first says calculated these. And these are points where there's gravitational stability between all the bodies. Um, and you can see here it is out here. Now, um, naturally, yeah, L2 is prime real estate. It's um, highly sought after. A lot of telescopes have, space telescopes have worked out from there um, and some continue to work out there. Um, so there's some advantages. Um, certainly one big advantage is, is less uh, fuel to keep it in that position because it's in a gravitational stable orbit. You're not having to spend, you're not having to spend a lot of energy and fuel adjusting your orbit and so on. And the other thing is it blocks, as we talked about earlier on, it blocks that light and the heat from the sun, the earth and the moon. So all the heat, because as you're about to learn, this telescope's designed to work in the infrared and infrared, what's infrared that we experience heat. So anything heat or infrared light, we do not want because it's just noise. Um, so it's, it's got the shield up, but also it's sitting in that gravitational stable point um, so it's quick and easy just with one shield, one direction, you've got all your heat and light in one direction from the moon, the earth and the sun, and you just simply blot it out with your large shield. Now it has got some disadvantages attached to that. Um, the most obvious one is that's a long way to go if something goes wrong. Remember this shuttle had about five service missions? Well, it's gonna be a lot difficult. And the bottom line is NASA said, look, we're not got no plans to go up there and sort any problems out. They have future proofed it. However, there is a little docking probe there that if in the unforeseen sort of future that someone decides they've got some crazy ideas to go up to it and do something to it, they have future proofed and put that dock in there, but um, there's no intention of using it. The other thing of course, is if you're gonna be sitting at L2, what's the big disadvantage about that? You're sitting in the shadow of the sun, I'm oh, sorry, the, 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 the shadow of the earth, the, the sun's blazing at you, but you've got the earth and you've got the earth's shadow. And as I mentioned earlier on, the James Webb is powered by solar power. So if you sat at L2, you wouldn't get any sunlight, which you do need. So what it does, it does a small little orbit here, not proportion, of course, um, this is uh, not to scale, but it does a small orbit around that L2 site. There's L2 orbits around with the earth and the moon around the sun. So does the L2 site, and it just quietly orbits around there. So that enables them to keep the gravity, the advantage of the gravitational stability of that position, uh, enables them just to have the big heat shield up and just block out the light and the heat in one, one hand, but it just allows a little bit of sunlight through to power its um, solar panels to keep it powered. So that's why it's out there at that crazy position. So what wavelength range does the James Webb operate and why does it operate at that wavelength? And this includes all its targets and stuff as well. So this is a spectrum um, of light known as electromagnetic radiation. Um, you'll see here, this is visible light. So you can see all the spectrum. This is what our eyes are used to. This is the most of the light from the sun is in this wavelength range here and our eyes have evolved for us uh, to adapted for us to see most efficiently in these wavelengths. Um, and it's a very narrow range. You can see there from 400 to 700 nanometer wavelengths, but read at this end, and there's the colors of the rainbow, of course, that go right through to your blue and your purple. Uh, more energetic wavelengths, you're going up to ultraviolet, to X-ray and gamma rays. And then the opposite direction, there's your infrared, which we're gonna be talking about. And then you go out to microwave and radios. So, um, now, the other thing to mention here, of course, visible lights get through the atmosphere, hence we can see. Why go into space to observe? Why don't we just sit this thing down here on the front lawn of the Goddard Space Center and be happy with it, it'd be a lot cheaper. Um, the, the problem is that infrared wavelength is uh, 
photons are absorbed in the atmosphere, namely by water vapor and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have a high affinity for infrared photons. When they come in through the atmosphere, they tend to get absorbed. So to get a decent infrared view, you've got to get above Earth's atmosphere. I put this slide in here um, just to show you how different objects, uh, so rather, um, well, actually that's another slide coming up, how probably the different telescopes are designed to look at different uh, ranges of wavelengths and they're designed to complement one another. Um, you can see here, here's the Hubble telescope that looks into the ultraviolet, covers all the visible and it just covers a little slither of what they call the near infrared. Here's the Spitzer out here. Um, that telescope has just been decommissioned. It was up there since I think 2003, I think, top of my head it was launched. That was an infrared telescope, but it saw predominantly in the far infrared. So it's this big gap here of the uh, sort of most of the near infrared and certainly all of the mid infrared range. And you're about to see very shortly why that's really, really important. That's been a gaping hole. Um, and our ability to observe the universe, and that's where the web is fitting in nicely. For those technically minded, the wavelengths is from 0.6 out to 25. 0.6 to 5, um, 0.6 nanometers out to 5 microns is um, your near infrared, and then 5 microns out to 28 is the um, mid infrared. Okay, um, so I just put in here as well that remember keeping in mind the mirror size of the JSW in the context of this as well, because remember. We see a bigger mirror, you get see a lot fainter objects um, and you see them in better resolution. So I just put this in the context, not only are they covering this lovely big gap here in the, in, in the uh, range of light, um, but look 6.5 meters versus the Hubble at 2.4 and the Spitzer uh, was less than a meter, 0.85. So that was doing the infrared out here, but look at the size of the mirror. This, this it really is something, this James Webb, can, you cannot understate the importance of the size the James Webb and covering in this, this sort of uncharted, if you will, sort of wavelength range. So it, you're getting the picture already. It's just going to open up some huge things in astronomy, the golden era in astronomy. So this here, uh, there's many design features, some of them that we've already mentioned. Um, that's what, what makes it so special. I've mentioned here the, um, the five layered tennis size uh, sun shade here. You can see there's the instruments, oh, that rather that's the solar panels and pack behind us powering it. You've got the big 6.5 meter beryllium gold coated mirror here. Um, so you've got that sitting here. You've got your instruments all packed in behind here. Once again, under the protection of the sh shade. So the shade is covering the mirror and it's covering the instruments. Um, these instruments we're going to have a close look at shortly are specifically designed to look into the infrared. So the other thing is I've mentioned here about the instrument, and you, you'll, you'll see shortly how the instruments are, are designed in many ways to view and be very efficient in the infrared wavelengths. Obviously that's going to be very important, but they've got to be cooled down. And there's cryogenics uh, around the whole instrument bay and around each individual instrument that lower the temperature around those instruments to minus 220 degrees Celsius. Why? Because heat uh, is a signal. It's infrared photons because they're infrared light. So that's noise. It's stuff. They're focusing. They want those photons from those faraway objects in outer space, and that's all they want. They do not want infrared photons from the heat um, of coming from noise from the sun, the earth. But you know what? With those instruments themselves, what are instruments? Instruments... Um, are electronic devices. We all know, you know, your computer, your TV, what do electronic devices do? They generate heat. So, which is, what is heat? Heat is noise. So the electronic instruments themselves create noise, their own noise to stuff up their own results. And that's why they cool those instruments right down. And that's one of the main things the telescope is doing at the moment. Um, it's, it takes weeks, not months, to get right down to those sort of temperatures where the cryogenics work and, this, and it's gonna obviously dissipate heat as well to outer space. Um, so those are some of the design features of it, in particular the ones that are there to um, allow um, good quality infrared uh, observing.
this is here, I've tossed this in here. This is the, all the instruments. There's a sort of, the instruments sit here um, in this big sort of uh, region here. It's a sort of a big framework that they're all structured. All, all the instruments are packed into, which we'll look at individually shortly. But that's them there. Here's your technician beside. So I put that in here. This is the instrument bay obviously lying on its side. So it gets tilted up like that and up against the back of the mirror. Um, so that's, that's the instrument panels there. All, it looks pretty high tech, doesn't it? So they're all packed together into one. And I'll just go back again to show you where they sit. I show that back here, didn't I? There it is. So here's your primary mirror, your secondary mirror, light coming in here, and all your instruments sit back here uh, with the Cassie Grain focus. So let's just go back to where we were. Okay, so here's your instruments here. So it's got uh, four main instruments um, that are designed to look in the infrared. So let's start looking at them. First up is the what they call the near cam, the near infrared camera. Very, very sensitive camera. Here's a picture without any cover on it, just to expose the internal optic collimating lenses um, and, and so on, and mirrors and stuff. In other words, mirrors and lenses just to keep all the, the light collimating means keeping all the light going in a straight line so it's well focused and is, is, is directed uh, directly to the instruments. Um, filter wheels, um, most, well, all telescopes have to have filter wheels on them, so you can only allow certain wavelengths of light in at a time per exposure. Um, so then you can analyze what's going on at those specific wavelengths. Um, here's a typical five wheel, um, a, a, a filter wheel. Um, it's got 29 specific wavelength filters, the smear cam. Um, so that's pretty incredible. It's also got a coronagram, which will show you what a coronagram is shortly, but essentially a coronagram is when it's something that they put in the instrument to blot out the glare of something bright so they can see something dimmer. And your classical example, of course, is, is blotting out a very bright um, star that's playing host to a very dim, close exoplanet. Yep. Next one is the near-infrared spectrograph, or the near spec. Um, and the idea behind this, so this is an imaging camera. The spectrograph is designed, it's got uh, prisms, you use a prism and gratings. That's able to split the light out into all the different wavelengths where you see sort of this is visible light, of course, getting um, spread out here. And you're all familiar with that sort of raindrop, uh, sort of raindrops spreading light out to create the rainbow um, or the cover of a popular 1970s album cover by Pink Floyd. Um, so that's the purpose of what a spectrograph does. And of course, even the infrared gets spread out again. Um, it can measure, it's pretty sensitive, and it can measure uh, the hundreds, the, the spectra, get light separately from a hundred separate galaxies at once. So you can have within the field of view a hundred different galaxies and can separately analyze all of those uh, 100 separate galaxies at once. So that's pretty special. So those are the uh, so those are first two instruments. Then you've got what we call the fine guidance sensor and near infrared imager and slip the spectrograph, um, or the NGS NIRIS. And essentially, what it is it? It's, it's a two in one deal. It's two totally separate independent instruments, but they just package together. Um, and the point of the fine guidance sensor is to um, to track to, to once the telescope's identified a target star or a target 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 object, it's able to focus and keep tracking on that object, keep the telescope focused on it, keep the mirrors. And remember in the optic diagram I showed you before, the, sort of where the light rays all went, I showed you that little fine steering mirror. Um, and I mentioned to you then that the FGS controls that mirror. So not only does it control the telescope, the telescope does happen to move a little bit or something gets out of focus, you know, microscopically, it's able to adjust that little, that little um, fine steering mirror and really make sure that light is properly focused on the instruments. So that's something pretty special. Um, NIRI is a, a near infrared uh, slitless spectrograph. Um, and you might say, well, what's the advantage of a slitless spectrograph? It's uh, not having a slit. Most spectrographs have a little wee narrow slip. So they narrow a little bit of a narrow slice of light from a, from a very small part of an object. Of course, if you don't have a slit, you can see a wider field of view. And you can also look at multiple objects at the same time. That comes at a cost of resolution, um, but it's still it's a very useful function. Um, it's got, got what they call aperture mask, masking interferometry. Um, that's where over the aperture, over the lens, they put a, a, 
an aperture, they block it out, they mask it, and they have lots of little holes in it. And the image of all the little holes individually get added up. And the word interferometry is used in astronomy, whereby you get multiple sources of things from slightly different views or different distances apart. And you bring them together create, to create a bigger sort of high resolution. Um, so it increases the angular re resolution or the sort of the detail you can see in something. And that's going to be really, really good for getting direct views of exoplanets. And the fourth main instrument is what's called MIRI or the mid infrared instrument. And that's a designed to look at the mid infrared wavelengths as opposed to those previous three, which were the near infrared. It's got a camera and a spectrograph on board and both of those have coronagrams. So why don't we look at coronagrams now? That's a coronagram in use. Um, so here is a, um, a host star, a little exoplanet. If you didn't have this object, this sort of blockage in front of it here, blocking that glare, that star would be so bright to the telescope, you couldn't see anything else. It'd, be, it'd just be a whitewash. You wouldn't see anything else. And you certainly wouldn't be able to see that exoplanet. All you've got to do is put the shield across here to block the glare from a bright, bright star and you can start seeing an exoplanet planets around the side you wouldn't otherwise normally see. And of course, you also, uh, a lot of young stars have uh, what we call circumstellar stellar disks around them of gas and dust, which we're going to have a look at shortly when new planets form. Uh, you wouldn't see those either. So a coronagram really is really, really important if you're going to be looking at those sort of disks and um, planets around the side of, um, of bright uh, host stars. Okay, so yeah, the sensors. So it's got um, CCC, CCD detectors. Um, and of course, these are detectors are very specific and very sensitive to viewing in the infrared. Now, first of all, what does a detector do? Detectors, the crucial, very crucial part, like anything else. Um, you know, you've got your big mirror and that captures and then all the photons from a distant object and then focuses them down and directs them to the instruments. And it's those convert those captured and and uh, focused photons that are then go to the detector. And it's the detector's job to convert those to electrical signals, which then give you your data and your images and, and so on. Um, and whereby normally it's it's all to do with semiconductors is the technology behind it. And silicon is the usual element that they use for semiconductors for light and visual wavelengths. But infrared photons are a lot lower energy, they're lower, they're, they've got less energy. So they often haven't got enough energy to trigger the detectors with silicon. So you've got to use other elements or other mixes. In the near infrared, there's actually um, 18 uh, detectors on board and 15 of them are on the, in the near infrared and three in the mid infrared. I'm gonna break that down shortly to the various instruments, but you'll see how the, the um, near cam is by far the most sensitive instrument. Um, so it's got 15 sensors in the near infrared and they use mercury, cadmium, and telluride based um, detectors for semiconductors. Four million pixels each um, because they're very large arrays because you, you've got to optimize the size of your pixels to the size of the wavelengths. The wavelengths are larger for infrared than visual. So your pixels got to be a little bit bigger. So 4 million pixels each, that's a lot of pixels of, for this relevant size of infrared detectors. That's real, that's real high tech stuff. Um, and the mid infrared, yeah, this, it's um, they silicon based, but they dope it with arsenic is what they do with that. So it's, it's a blender mix. So here's the slide here that does um, show it. Yeah, so they've got large arrays and those large arrays with the 17 you know, state-of-the-art detectors, um, comparing it with their predecessors, in particular, say the Spitzer, which is looking in the far infrared, Spitzer Space Telescope, much lower noise, larger formats, so you have large, wider field of views, larger detectors, um, and longer lasting than predecessors. If they can keep those temperatures down, they'll, the, those detectors will last a, a good length of time. Um, so here's how they're laid out. Um, so here's your near infrared detectors. As you can see, 10 of 18 of those are on the near cam. So that sort of highlights how sensitive it is. The near infrared spectrometer has got two, the fine guidance system and the near infrared imager and slitless spectrograph has three. And MIRI, which is the mid infrared uh, camera and spectrograph has got three sensors um, for their mid infrared wavelengths. 
So that just gives you a bit of insight into what's going on in the detectors. People forget all about the detectors. We talk about telescopes, we talk about mirrors, we talk about focus, focusing stuff and light paths and instruments, but we forget about the poor old detectors. They are crucial to the game. So I thought that was well worth putting in here. Um, okay, now I put this slide in because you might think, well, what's, you know, what's the purpose? Where are we heading with this? And my main point is here, this is sort of, this is what we've just gone over, how MIRI covers the mid-infrared um, and these three instruments, near cam spec and, and, and NIRIS cover the near infrared. But the point of all of this is it's this region here, the near, infra, near infrared, that reveals a lot of the cooler red stars are very prominent and pumping out lots of uh, infrared photons in the near infrared sort of range. And you find it, I'm gonna show you some lovely pictures shortly, how dust obscures a lot of uh, young stars and young planets. Visible light, does not get through. Dust is opaque, but dust becomes transparent to infrared, and particularly in the near infrared. So that's the importance there. Why look in the mid infrared? Then you say, oh, well, we've got everything here. There's a lot more to be seen yet. In the mid infrared, you can start seeing the, you know, the planets, comets, and asteroids. So small bodies I, I emit a lot of light in the, in the mid infrared. Um, dust that sort of glows, you're probably seeing pictures of the Milky Way and infrared wavelengths and you see there's all this dust glowing, that glows in the, in the mid and the far infrared as opposed to the near infrared. So if you want to have a better idea of where dust is and how it's behaving, that's where you, those are the sort of wavelength range you want to look at. And those disks are around the, the young stars where new planets are forming, once again, they are better seen in the mid infrared. And yep, you can see through the dust in the near infrared and in the mid infrared, you can actually see the objects better. Point. So really, um, the James Webb is designed to look into the infrared wavelengths so astronomers can observe, we're going to look at this now, expand into the first stars and galaxies in the universe, planets forming around young stars, and looking for signatures of life on these exoplanets. Of course, I should have introduced the idea of an exoplanet. An exoplanet refers to a planet that's not part of our solar system. It's either going around a host, usually it's going around a host planet, um, a host star rather. There are some vagabond planets out there just on their own roaming around, but it would, it's usually used in the context of um, planets going around other stars other than our sun. And you'll see in doing this, once again, my main thread here, it's providing a gateway to a golden era in astronomy. So this diagram here, so let's have a look about looking at the first stars and galaxies. This is a very common sort of diagram that you'll often see on the internet and in books and stuff. And what it is, let's just go over it briefly. It's about the evolution of the universe. So here's your big bang, um, rapid expansion. Sort of the universe was very opaque to light in these early stages and the first 380,000 years. And then you've got your cosmic microwave background. That's as far back, further as you can see back in light. I've got a whole talk that's coming up later in the year. Um, I actually raise it, there's gonna be raised two or three different talks, the cosmic microwave background. Let's not get too long about that now. Then there's a period of here, of the dark ages, where there were no stars. Stars hadn't had time to form yet, but slowly gravity kicked in and the very first stars in the galaxies came into being. We don't know exactly when that was, I think this diagram says about 400 million years. I think it can be a lot earlier than that speculation. It could be as early as 200 million years. We haven't seen this. We don't know yet for sure, but you're talking that sort of time frame anyway. They formed here, and then slowly you'll see here the universe started uh, continued to expand. It's particularly the expansion has been more prominent in the last sort of four to five billion years. So that's a, a popular diagram. The Hubble telescope, and I'll show you an image shortly, can see back to about 13.4 billion years. That's the furthest it's ever seen. It predominantly looks back to about here, but it, it has seen galaxy uh, out to about here, and I'll show you the image very shortly. But yep, that is still out of our reach. And it makes sense. If you want to understand the evolution of the universe, it makes a lot of sense. You've got to observe and study the very first stars and the first galaxies because you're lost without that. And hello, what's the elephant in the room? The James Webb Telescope, yay! It views in the infrared and big large to a mirror. So let's have a close look at this. I put this slide in. So to give you an idea um, of why the James Webb is important for these first stars and galaxies. The first stars were big. They were powerful, much bigger than we see today. They were blazing 
intensely with ultraviolet light. So light in these high end wavelengths out here, low wavelength, high energy I'm referring to. So they would have been blazing high intensity ultraviolet. But two things have happened since then. Well, the universe expanded, but with the expansion of the universe, the photons of light and ultraviolet from these big stars has been stretched out too. And it's been stretched out to visible and infrared wavelengths from the, from the ultraviolet ones, because light itself, as the photons go through light, so space has expanded and expanded those photons. And of course, as the universe expanded, that light's got further and further away, or the stars have got further and further away, so they've got dimmer. So the light has got dimmer over time, and it's been stretched into longer, longer wavelengths into visible and infrared. And this here is what the, the James Webb is going to be able to look at for us. We're certainly hoping so. You might say, oh, makes more sense to have a look here in the visible. Um, that's the Hubble's looking into the, into the visible. And of course, the Hubble's got a its primary mirror is a mere 2.4 um, 4.2.4 meter um, diameter. So it hasn't got the grunt, the power. It can only see back at, at tops that extreme 13.4 billion years. So this is the job with its big, large mirror. Um, it's designed for infrared viewing. This is the patch that is going to be viewed by James Webb. And that's going to be crucial for us to understand the first stars, the first galaxies, and in, in, in the process, the evolution of the universe. I threw this in here because this is this is the, the furthest galaxy that the Hubble has seen. Um, there it is blowing out here. Why can we see it? Yeah, that, that's the Hubble can't just see everything at 13.4 billion years ago. It's just one little object that, that sort of claimed to fame is that's the furthest object. And the reason we can see that faraway object, just out of luck, um, it just so happens, there's a nice big uh, cluster of galaxies sitting right between in, in our line of sight. If you've got that, that faraway galaxy, we're here, Right in the middle, you've got a lovely big um, galaxy cluster. And that X is what we call a gravitational lens. That's a whole separate talk. But the bottom line is that gravity around that big cluster warps space just much like a lens does and allows us to see um, magnified image, albeit a bit distorted, but it's magnified image of that faraway galaxy. Um, so once we're able to James Webb is to be able to look further back and observe these, not only will you see the stars, but it makes sense these stars are going to go supernova. Um, in these early galaxies, you're going to start forming the active centers of galaxies called active galactic nuclei or AGN, that the whole separate talks in themselves. But you can get the general picture. You're going to see the first stars, how they form, the first galaxies, how do they build up, you know, piece by piece by mergers. Um, you know, how, what were supernova explosions like with those early large stars? How did these big supermassive black holes in the center of these galaxies, how did they start forming? How did they get going? These are all crucial pieces of information for us to underlearn the, to learn the, and understand the evolution of the universe. And this is what James Webb's gonna be doing. So that's the early stars and galaxies. The second point, the big thing it's going to do, um, it's going to be able to look at young stars and early planets forming around them. And as we've alluded to before, you get a lot of dust that surrounds these early stars and planetary formations when they're forming. And this is some Hubble telescope image and visible wavelengths. And then in the very sort of, as I mentioned, that the Hubble can see just slightly into the near infrared. So just a slither, and that's a little bit of that wavelength range in there, so it's infrared. Um, and this is what they call the pillars of creation. You've probably heard of those before. They're sort of essentially these big finger-like or pillar-like structures of gas and dust in the Eagle Nebula, also known as M16. Um, and you see in this, the visual wavelengths here, it's, all you see is these big pillars or fingers of dust, and you can't really see what's going on inside there. Look, that's the same, same spot but in infrared wavelengths, suddenly you can see through the gas and dust, and in particular the dust. And look, you're seeing all these young stars through here. So the James Webb is even going to get a better view again, but in higher resolution. So it's going to blow all this out of the water. So infrared light penetrates through dust. That visual light doesn't. And that's going to be a, that's a huge um, incentive to have an infrared telescope up in space, namely the James Webb telescope. So that's going to blow this astronomy apart. Here's a nice, this is just an, an artist impression. Here's your host star. You've got this big sort of circumstellar or protoplanetary, if you will, um, disk of dust and gas just rotating around it here. And it's 
the, the theory is that this is where planets form from these, um, you can see protoplanets forming here in this artist impression. It's these big, but up till now, you really can't get a decent view of them. You can get a bit of a view in the far infrared from ALMA, the Atacama large millimeter, multi-millimeter array. You've probably seen one or two images there, but that's in the far infrared where the dust is just glowing. We wanna see just through the dust and get in there and look at these planets that um, are emitting light in the near infrared. And that's what the James Webb's gonna do with great resolution. And the third thing I mentioned is gonna be looking at into exoplanets, the atmosphere of exoplanets. So up till now, you know, we're okay at identifying exoplanets. From the data, they can get an idea of the size, whether they're rocky or not by their densities and the emotions around the stars. Um, but they can't really get too much information about atmospheres. Is there an atmosphere and so on? And this is where the James Webb's going to come in very, very handy. It's going to be able to analyze the atmosphere of exoplanets, assuming they've got an atmosphere, of course. And the, the, the idea behind it is that if you've got a, um, a host star here, you've got your, we're, we're, so I'm just getting my hands right because everything's back to front with my viewing here. Um, so let, let's make this one here, the, the host star, this one here is Earth, and you get your in-between hand, you've got your exoplanets. And as the light shines from the host star through the atmosphere of the exoplanet through to Earth, we can look at that light. And they do what they call these spectrographs in particular. And with spectrographs, you split it as we talk about all the different wavelengths. And if you've got molecules, compounds in that atmosphere through which that light is traveling, those molecules and compounds absorb light at specific wavelengths very, very specific wavelengths to that particular molecule or to that particular compound, like fingerprints, very sort of, you know, um, I, which to identify them. So in particular, what would they be looking for? Oxygen, O2 and O3, oxygen molecules in the atmosphere, because that would give a hint that perhaps some photosynthesis is occurring, some plant-based photosynthesis is occurring if you're getting loads of oxygen there. Water vapor, the water vapor itself doesn't mean life, but, it, but of course, what do we know about life is we know it uh, requires water. And I think Peter Fellhopper did a beautiful talk about three years ago called Aliens Drink Water. Um, because what else are they going to drink? Water is such a lovely solvent. Hydrogen's everywhere, oxygen's everywhere. Water, as far as we're aware, and we can reasonably make a safe assumption, water is essential to life as we know it. Um, methane, CH4. Methane is produced by geological processes and biological, but it's far more likely, it's 10 times more likely to be produced by biological process than geological. So if you see abundant amounts of, of methane, it's sort of, you know, you think, oh, hello, a little flag goes up, that's interesting. Um, methanol, um, methanol is produced by the degradation and so on by biological products, um, decay and so on of biological products. So if you see that, that's a good strong hint of life. Of course, if you see CFCs, what are chlorofluorocarbons, um, uh, which was happily destroying our ozone layer, which we've now banned. But of course, they are artificially made. So if you see CFCs in the atmosphere of a planet, hello, you've got some argu arguably intelligent uh, life form down there. Um, and of course, pollution, if you see pollution, yeah, you know you've got some, you've got some um, life down there that they consider themselves to be uh, intelligent, but maybe they're not. But the bottom line is you've got some civilizations going on there if you see pollution. And this is a sort of a lot of the stuff you'd see if you looked at Earth in particular, you get some real red flags going up, pollution, um, previously CFCs and so on. Um, okay, I'll put this slide in here to show you. Um, this just recaps the wavelength ranges of the Spitzer. Uh, here's, here's the Atacama, Alma that we talked about. There's the Spitzer that we spoke about earlier. Here's the James Webb and there's your Hubble. And you can see they have their own sort of niche, a little bit of overlap, but predominantly their own little niche, their own sort of prime area they're viewing it. And look where the James Webb is looking at this near and mid infrared. Hello, what's sitting in here? Um, it's, it's all your monocles that we're gonna be looking for, your H2O, your CO2. Uh, your methane, your methanol, their monocles, remember I said those particular compounds or monocles absorb light at particular wavelengths that, that sort of um, that sort of spells specifically to them. They're all in the range at which the James Webb looks in. So it's, it's all just coming together beautifully, making up a lovely picture for you. I put this, this is what spectrograph lines look like when the sort of when they, the data gets converted and the computer puts it into nice lines. That would normally be all the, all the wavelengths, but you get these little dips and that's where 
specific wavelengths of light has been absorbed and sort of fingerprints, if you will. And they know from the laboratory measurements, particular compounds, they know exactly at what wavelengths the dips specify what chemicals. And that's pretty much how spectroscopy works, in particular looking for um, analyzing um, atmospheres of exoplanets, looking for signatures of life. Okay, so what are you going to be the what are going to be some of the first targets that NASA is going to go after? The two that I think of straight away is the Trappist One system and Proxima Centauri. Um, I've got a whole talk on red dwarfs and stuff about how they're very very uh, common that seventy over seventy percent of all stars in the sky in the galaxy are all red dwarfs. They live nice long ages. Uh, they live a lot longer than the ten billion odd years that, for example, our sun will live. So there's time for planets to form life to evolve and so on. So it makes sense that uh, red dwarfs are prime candidates go looking for planets around them and analyze those planets. Uh, Proxima Centauri, it's about four light years away from us, 4.2 light years away. That's got three exoplanets, two of which are in the habitable zone. Habitable zone refers to just the, the Goldilocks zone, the right distance from the star, whereby if it was any closer, any liquid water on the surface would boil off any further out and it would just turn to ice. So it's that sort of happy spot, if you will, where you get liquid water on the surface where it's possible to be there, the right temperatures. And um, so there's Proxima Centauri and there's the Trappist system, which is about 40 light years away from us. And it's got seven Earth-sized planets, three of which are in the habitable zone. So that's you know, potentially a gold mine to go analyzing um, those, those uh, seven planets around the Trappist system, in particular, the three in the habitable zone. So it's going to be one of the first targets. And I've put here this diagram here, partly because it looks pretty cool. Here's, here's your red dwarf, but here, here's your seven stars around the Trappist one. And like close in here, it's all pretty hot and things are getting scorched. The further you go out, they put liquid water here. So you're getting um, three planets here where you've got uh, liquid water. It's possible to get liquid water. The further you go out, you get more and more liquid water on the surface. And then they've sprinkled ice around here to signify that you're beyond the cool, the ice line. Anything water beyond here, a certain distance from a certain star um, will have ice in, as opposed to liquid water on its surface. So as I've mentioned, yes, yeah, seven planets, seven of which are Earth size, three in the habitable zone. It's got a large planet to star ratio. In other words, you're not, it's got, hasn't got just one or two. Oh, okay, we've got to go and hook on another star now. Hey, you're looking at one star and you can get in there while you're there and have a good look at seven planets. So that makes it ideal for observing. It'll try to determine whether each of these planets has an atmosphere or not. And as I've talked about the basic composition of these atmospheres in particular. Hey, are there any sort of signatures, biological signatures of life, what they call biosignatures? So at this stage, so this is what we've done. We've, we've really had a good look at the telescope, what it looks like on the, on the front lawn of the James Webb. We've gone through the nice picture gallery um, of, of what it looks like, um, you know, all folded up and unfolded. We've seen the video of it deploying over the month. Um, so we've done that. Um, we've looked at about L2, the Lagrange point, why it's sitting out there, why it's stable and how it can keep cool out there and conserve energy, conserve power. And we've talked about how it observes in the uh, near and mid infrared, infrared um, range of light and the importance of that. It's gonna able us to look at the first stars and planets and galaxy from information. And, uh, yeah. and, and young stars and exoplanets. So I'm gonna move on now to chapter five. We're gonna look at two short videos and I'm gonna give you an update there of what some, some press releases today from NASA and three paper messages. Um, someone's just got their mic on there. They may just want to uh, put that on mute. Thanks very much. So here's one just by the Canadian Space Space Agency. I've had it quite good. It gave a nice little summary of what we've talked about. And unashamedly, it gives a little plug for the Canadian Space Agency. That's pretty cool. So it's only about a minute and a half or so. So here, here we go. Let's, let's, let's watch it. The James Webb Space Telescope is the most powerful space observatory ever built. Gathering infrared light invisible to the human eye, its penetrating gaze will behold the earliest moments in cosmic time and search distant worlds for evidence of life. The Canadian Space Agency is collaborating with NASA and the European Space Agency on the James Webb Telescope. 
Canada has contributed two key elements, the NERIS instrument and the fine guidance sensor. NERIS will keep watch as faraway planets pass in front of their host stars and will gather the spectrum of light filtering through the atmospheres of rocky super-Earths, mysterious ocean worlds, and gigantic hot Jupiters to create a chemical fingerprint that could be a match with the vital clues of life. Water, carbon dioxide, and oxygen may lurk within the atmospheres of these enigmatic exoplanets. Paris will also take a closer look at the distant universe, peering back in time to see youthful galaxies just cosmic minutes after they formed. To perform these unprecedented observations, sometimes from billions of light years away, the telescope's gaze must stay perfectly still. Webb's fine guidance sensor will latch onto key reference points in deep space during all of the telescope's observations. Its remarkable precision will help the telescope capture sharp images of swirling, merging galaxies, newborn stars, and bubbling nebulas that have never been seen before. The James Webb Space Telescope will pierce through layers of cosmic dust to unveil the unique mysteries of the universe and fuel groundbreaking astronomical research for decades to come. So that's sort of um, just a brief, once again, now in the context, now you've, we've pretty much gone over all of that. So that should have, um, you know, made, made you know, sort of uh, a lot of, you know, sort of brought it all together for you, what we've been talking about. So what is the James Webb Telescope doing at the moment? So it's essentially, the bottom line is it's cooling down, as we've spoken about, it's got to get to 200 and minus 220 degrees Celsius to minimize no noise from the electronics to allow it to sort of radiate heat away from itself, allow for the cryogenics to be cooling those instruments down to those real low temperatures. So the electronic heat, the heat from the electronics itself is not interfering with the, with the data. So it's cooling down, it's calibrating its instruments, um, it's aligning and calibrating its mirror, which we're gonna have a look at shortly. The mirror is, as you saw, made up of 18 hexagonal segments. So it's, it's bringing all those into alignment. And the initial, um, Target star, they picked a star, HD 84406, and that's in major, uh, Ursula Major constellation. And it was a star they picked out, it was a reasonably bright star out on its own. So it was not a lot of background stars, it was a nice one to focus on. And here you've got 18 images, the first sort of image they got of it, 18 different images. Why? Because you've got 18 different mirrors, uh, segments of mirrors, I should say, and they're all in, they're not fully all lined up yet. So you've got 18 little hexagonal pictures, so that's quite cool. And one of the steps they do, they just completed on the 25th of February. Um, they were able to, to align all them together again, whereby all those 18 images merged into one. So they've got all the mirrors all sort of focusing on the one point in space now, producing that one image. So that, that's pretty cool. That's called stacking. Look at that. Um, this was what NASA uh, released today. It's a new target star. Um, they were very, very happy with this. They said, look, this is far greater that the resolution out of this uh, picture, they said, look, far exceeded their expectations. It just blew everyone away. They're just so thrilled with it. This star is a hundred times fainter than you would see a star normally with the unaided eye. So it's really, really faint. Um, but look how it's so bright the target star here, that it just washed out all the detectors and everything. You've got these um, spikes going out. Those are corners of hexagonal um, mirror, the segments. You've got all the bleeding, if you will, of the light here, sort of it's, it's spilling over the pixels and so on. And that's just because it's so bright. They were quite thrilled to see that because it just illustrates how sensitive everything is. But look at all these out here, look at all these. These are galaxies, galaxies. You'd never see the galaxies in the infrared that you wouldn't see with other telescopes. And look at them. They're just scattered everywhere through the background. You blow some of these pictures up, which I can't do right now, but some of the detail in these galaxies already. And this is just the early stage. This is just aligning and, and, and calibrating and playing around with target stars. Um, I'm sure they won't tell you it's not playing around, but you know what I mean? We're not even doing any serious science. They're still doing the technical side of setting it up and it's already starting to blow them away. So they're absolutely thrilled with this. So this picture is hot off the press. It came out from NASA overnight. So they're pretty, pretty happy with that. 
uh, very distant stars and galaxies. Um, here's a little video, this uh, press release that came with it. They did an interview. This is about one and a half minutes long. And the guy talks about this process and how happy they are. So let's see some happy NASA, NASA technicians, shall we? We got together and looked at the very first diffraction limited images that came out of the Webb telescope. And what we collectively saw as a group is we have the highest resolution infrared images taken from space ever. So you think of it as a blob on a, on a picture, you know, but it is extremely high resolution. We have uh, exceeded every expectation. The telescope has, has performed better than the models said it should. It, we've, we've even achieved, uh, uh, you know, we talk about resolution and, and wavefront quality. We've, we've done better in those regards than we thought we would do. And we're just thrilled to death. And to get there, we went through a process. Well, we did the segment identification and then we formed the image array. And then once they were in the image array, we used this phase retrieval technology to position each of the mirror segments and the secondary mirror itself such that all the optical aberrations were effectively eliminated. We tilt the mirror segments to bring the light from each mirror so that it falls on top of each other at a common point in the middle of the detector. And we call that image stacking. And that concentrates all the light in a single place, but the images, the, the segments themselves are not cooperating. They're not uh, working together at that point. They're all their own individual telescope. And the next phase in the process is something we call coarse phasing. And that's where we adjust, well, literally it's the piston. It's the up and down motion of the mirror segments relative to each other. We control the piston of the segments so that they all come together in creating a complete monolithic primary mirror. If you know exactly what the shape of that telescope is and you know exactly how the light is falling on your detector, it turns out that you can prove, you can actually prove mathematically that that is enough information to tell you exactly what you need to do to that telescope to fix the alignment errors. And why do we know this? We know this because of something called a pupil imaging lens. And this allows us to take a picture of the primary mirror of the telescope. People have referred to it as a selfie. Right? Well, that's, that's what it is actually. But that's really important mathematically. Now there's a catch, however. Just because you know a solution to something exists does not automatically give you that solution. And that is the difficult part. That's what we have spent 20 years working out. It's highly mathematical, uses something called Fourier analysis. But that's what we do is we, we tease out those solutions and we find what we need to do to each optical element to achieve perfection. We then turn to a different way of doing phase retrieval across the entire aperture of the telescope at the same time. And, and for that, we're not going to take the telescope out of focus. Instead, we have some, some lenses that are in one of the science instruments that we use to automatically create a defocused image. And we look at these images and taken as a whole, then we can tell the last little bit of alignment errors that are, that are in the telescope that we need to fix. And that's what we accomplished today. We analyze those images and we apply the corrections leading to the diffraction limit of the perfect performance of the telescope. So there's only one thing left to do, and that's to see how well the telescope is aligned in the other science instruments. And we'll check the alignment there. And if necessary, then we'll apply a solution that optimizes for the entire telescope. We then periodically measure the alignment of the telescope and make corrections as necessary. I cannot wait to see what it discovers. I can't, we all can't wait. He's not alone there. Okay. Okay, so those are those little two videos and an update of where the telescope's at. So it's time to get your three sticky messages to take home. Um, so first, one message, the first message is that James Webb is an international collaboration. Remember, it was between the American NASA, the European Space Agency, which was 22 countries, and the Canadian Space Agency. All together, chip in their money, their technology, $10 billion budget for it what it cost, 25 odd years in the making. Number two, it orbits a gravitationally stable point, 1.5 million kilometers from Earth, called the Lagrange two point, and it observes at infrared wavelengths. So it's sitting at one and a half million kilometers out in space, and it's designed to look at the infrared. And through looking at the infrared, it'll observe the first stars and galaxies of the universe. It'll view new stars and planets forming, plus 
it'll look at the atmospheres of these exoplanets. Um, and essentially, and importantly, though through doing that, it's providing a gateway to a golden era in astronomy. So I hope you've enjoyed the James Webb Space Telescope, Gateway to a Golden Era in Astronomy. Thank you. And here is time for questions. I put here, this is um, uh, Dr. Becky. She's on YouTube. We're subscribing to you, looking her up. She's got a lovely channel and she brings you all these updates from NASA and stuff and videos and what have you. That's where I get a lot of my updates from. So I put that there as well. Um, so any questions, if anyone wants to sort of look at the slides again later in at later stage, they'll be online. Also, you're welcome to email me at cbenton at extra.co.nz, BB. Uh, but James, any on the chat room there, any questions? I can't see the chat room. Any questions there, James? Nothing yet. Okay. Oh, that's good. Everyone's all happy that they know everything about the James Webb Telescope. Yep, and go home and tell everyone. It's the gateway to a golden era in astronomy. So when you talk about then um, analyzing the atmospheres around the exoplanets, I assume that they'll be uh, using the prism and getting a spectrum and then be able to see what's in the spectrum. It's a spectrograph. It's spectroscopy as, this, as opposed to imagery. It's spectroscopy. Uh, this, this is good work. This is just going out. So this is all good. This is all good to... Um, to, uh, as I mentioned here, here's the, the, the instrument here. So it goes for a prism or a grating. Sometimes they use a combination of them all because they redirect light and split it up and redirect it again to the instruments. But yeah, you split the light open through the spectrographs and, and there's all your wavelengths. And a classic example, of course, is your rainbow. Just white light hits some rain droplets. They act as a prism and spread it all apart. Um, and so, yeah, the, the bottom line is this, the, the atmospheres will be analysed with spectroscopy such that um, you can pull all the wavelengths apart and you will be seeing they, the, the data they look at looks like that, where you see these dips at specific wavelengths. That the, when I say specific wavelengths, wavelengths specific to specific compounds. When you see a wavelength at a XYZ, uh, a dip at an XYZ wavelength, um, you go and go, Oh, that's methanol. Oh, okay. There must be something organic down there that's breaking apart. Or, oh, that's oh, there's some oxo two monocles in there. Oh, there might be some plant photosynthesis going on, and so on. That's where they sit there in the infrared. I'll go back over just because I know a few people came in. Everyone's got things to do, and I'm actually going to go back since we've got time. Just look at our little gallery we had at the very start. Just the people who missed out on that. Um, so hi guys, just re briefly, really, it's quite a good way to finish up too. So that's, that's a, a full scale model of the James Webb Telescope sitting on the lawn at James at the um, Goddard Space Center, about 400 odd people there, a, a um, five layered sun shield, the size of a tennis court to block and shield away from the, the glare or the, the heat and the light from the sun, the earth and the moon. There's your big, um, your big mirror there, six and a half meter diameter that's look at the compared to the size of the people there and it's made of capton which is a thermoplastic material which tolerates extreme heat and extreme cool temperatures um, that's the beryllium mirror i mentioned there the uh, mirror segments made of beryllium because it's a uh, nice metal it's very lightweight to get up into space and to operate in space and it really keeps the frigidity frigidity in the colder space it doesn't become brittle i mentioned gold coated uh, mirrors because they reflect infrared wavelengths better than anything else and of course they're nice and stable they tend they not to corrode then i showed the lovely pictures here of it being folded up um, gets the size of the technicians we talked about the large mirror how it enables better resolution and enables you to see fainter objects make them brighter why because you're capturing more photons more little particles of light and that was the picture there of the secondary mirror and its support because a few people missed some of this, I just I let a few people in on the way. So I'm, that's why I'm just going over this. Um, and this is the um, anastagmatic three mirror, um, anastagmatic design. Uh, it's a cassegrain focus. In other words, the focus, focus points behind the mirror here. Light comes in, hits the primary mirror to the secondary mirror, to a tertiary mirror. And those mirrors are curved and designed whereby it enables the telescope to have a wide field 
of view, but with minimal aberrations, comes back to this fine st steering mirror to really focus that light as accurately as possible onto the, uh, onto the instruments that sit back here. And that's guided by the fine, guide, um, fine guidance sensor. So I think that was sort of the bit that a few people want to stay on that's, that was worth just, I made a note to myself to recap on. But otherwise, I think we've, yeah, we've covered it all. So if everyone's- So the, the question from uh, Ben, he says that initially it was uh, designed to run for 10 years with the current fuel and everything, but as everything has gone perfectly well, uh, will we get an extension on this? Yeah, initially, good, good question, Ben, absolutely. Um, initially it was designed, the primary mission was, uh, was quoted to be about five years. And then they use the word nominal. Nominal means, you know, without hiccup. Um, and the, the launch was nominal, whereby they didn't have to use any excess fuel. So they then realized we've got actually plenty of spare fuel on board because everything went so smoothly with launch. Um, we can safely extend it out to probably closer to 10 years. And the last I heard, it was about four or five weeks ago, though some of the NASA guys were even talking possibly 20 years. So I don't know, somewhere between 10 and 20 years, but yeah, optimistically up to 20 years. So from the initial five years, but I think a lot of those things, they remain cautious and they always have a primary mission that's very conservative time-wise, and then they extend it out. So yeah, it, it looks to be optimistically up, up to 20 years, Ben, which is, yeah, which is pretty cool. That's the Lagrange point there, point two. So now, so now we've got this fancy new telescope. What's the next telescope? Ah, good question. The Nancy Grace Roman telescope. That's the, the next big space telescope. There's a whole generation of exciting telescopes, ground-based telescopes. You know how they, they came out at various sizes and then the, the generation just that sort of that came to light in the early 90s was the big 10, 8 and 10 meters. And they were pretty cool and exciting and stuff. The next generation of ground telescopes that are all going to be seeing first light in the next sort of, you know, two to five years or so, the extremely large telescope, the, um, uh, the um, uh, what's her, the lady's name, uh, Vera Rubin uh, Observatory um, in Chile that used to be called, that were formerly was going to be called the Large Synoptics uh, Telescope. Um, you've got the Magellan Telescope, you've got the 10 meter, uh, sorry, the 30 meter telescope is going to be on the top of Mauna Kea. So you've got about four or five huge, big, essentially roughly about 30 meter telescopes coming online in the coming years. That is going to be amazing. That's going to blow out a lot, all the data from, the, from the, the amazing 10 meter telescopes. Space telescopes, yeah, um, the next one is going to be the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. I think it's going to be just called the, the Roman Space Telescope. And that's also going to be looking at infrared, um, slightly different part of the infrared. So that's worth looking at. I think that's coming online in 2025, apparently. Okay. I was just going to say, I thought it was 2028, but 25. Okay. Sooner than well, that's exciting. It's good. A so seven, seven point eight feet wide field of view. Yeah. And that's going to be the big thing. It's going to be great for surveying uh, with a nice big wide field of view. Because that was one of the actually, that's a good, who asked that question? That was good. I thought of that myself and I, and I made a point of just curiosity uh, looking it up. I asked that question. You asked that question. <laughs> Chocolate fish, there you go. Um, yeah, but no, that's, that's the question. Oh, what's next on the board? When I was doing my research for this, and uh, yeah, it's the Nancy, uh, Nancy Grace Roman Telescope. There's also the 30 meter telescope in Hawaii that's in that's development. Up, that, that's the TNT on the top of Mauna Kea. You've got yeah. the Magellan telescope, the extremely large telescope, and the Vera Rubin telescope. The square kilometer array is also due to come yeah. out. Plato is another one. Yep. The it's one. trying to be alive. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's tons of them coming up. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's all good. Any other questions there? Okay. It just says uh, great presentation. Oh, it's got a, a lot of fun anyway. So it's, I uh, hope everyone. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Chris. Everyone. It was great. Yep. No, that's all good, guys. So, um, yeah, we had 16 people on board. So I think that's all good. We'll um, say good night and uh, see everyone in a couple of weeks' time. Do you want to just stop the recording? Certainly. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's stop. I think that's up here now. Record. Uh, more. Stop recording.